This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. The people that live in the canal are a ragtag group of people from all walks of life, but the majority of them are deported from the United States. Most are men, although some are women, and they have no ties to Tijuana in general. They might have been born in Sonora or Guerrero, and they don't want to go back there. They lived maybe in the U.S. their entire lives. So it's really sad. Many of them don't have any identification. Some of them don't even speak Spanish. And so they're homeless and they trickle down to the canal because there's nowhere else for them to go. HIV AIDS in San Diego and what's called VIH SIDA in Tijuana in many ways are very similar. The virus concentrates in the same groups on both sides of the border. But what's different is the response and the speed at which the virus is spreading through these different populations. So in Tijuana, no one really knew exactly where the virus was. And you have to know that to have an effective response to end epidemics. So the UCSD group came in and started to carefully look at each of these populations that have high concentrations of the virus, men who have sex with men, transgender women, sex workers, and in particular, people who shoot heroin and other drugs and share their syringes. Proyecto Alcuete is a cohort study. And in epi speak, that basically means you're following a group of people over time. You know, and the people that are the classical trained epidemiologists, they get people to fill out surveys and mail them in once a year. And they get to call them and say, oh, it's time for your visit. Can you come in and give us all these specimens? And people do it. Um, we have a totally different population. Many of them, in fact several hundred, are living in the Tijuana River Canal at any given time. So when you have a study like this, you need to have staff that can go out in the field and be accepted by a population that generally is very suspicious of authorities. And you need to be able to track these people over time um, to be able to tell their stories so that you can um, use those data to argue for more interventions. Well, basically, this clinic is from staff from El Cuete. And what we do is we start coming to the canal to reach out for our participants. And I find out that world, my staff is, you know, reaching out for participants. And I was like, I can do something to help. Patty Gonzalez is a doctor from Tijuana. And she grew up there. and. She lives in both worlds. She works at UCSD. In Tijuana, she has her own clinic, and she runs the clinic for the El Cuete project. And she also does a free Friday clinic in the canal for many of the people there who never want to go see a doctor. 
A ver, ¿qué tal? ¿Qué tal? ¿Qué tal? ¿Qué tal? She takes them, you know, one at a time and inspects any wounds they have and listens to their chests and does the odd HIV test and uh, is aware that she's only scratching the surface in terms of the care they need. But it's, it's a very important thing to be doing because um, symbolically it's meant that the medical community has actually gone to the canal. So it breaks down a traditional barrier that may exist between people who are destitute and marginalized and medical care. Where did you deport? From Anaheim. Well, down here is, a, well, you see it's like the, um, it's like a community of like IV drugs users, people who inject drugs. Um, they live here, they eat here, they bath here. Por lo menos eso está muy bien. Ok. Gracias. Qué bueno que le di la sonrisa. Eso por lo menos le digo, por lo menos eso está bien. Entonces espérese aquí que le traigan la medicina. Ándale pues. Que tengan buena tarde y Dios la bendiga. Ándale pues. Mainly they have, you know, a skin condition and skin infections. We're seeing like uh, abscesses. With, they have diarrheas, they have, um, you know, gastroenteritis and, uh, but lately we've been seeing a lot of lesions or like necrotic lesions on their skin and probably it's because a product of the drugs that they've been using. Sí, y si se rasca de ahí se lo lleva para otro lado. Ya no se My resources are really limited, so I find it that Sometimes there are people that just need like a, my hand to be touching them, but usually I clean wounds and I give hydration solutions and basically first aid. Where Patty sets up is so fetid, there is defecation all around the pillars that hold the bridge that cross the canal itself, and they put lye on it to try to deal with it. The stench is enough to make anyone run. The water that passes by is you know, raw sewage some of the time. The first time that I came here, that was I couldn't stand like maybe five minutes because I was like getting this bad odor. But right now we're, we've been coming every week and I mean, it's familiar. You get familiar to this smell and it's like, it's your environment, so you notice. Se va a esperar diez minutitos. Claro que sí. Para que esté su resultado y le voy a dar un papelito con su nombre, Ajá. la fecha del día de hoy y su resultado. ¿sí? Claro, gracias. Okay. We have here uh, my team, our team, El Cuete team, and uh, we have two nurses and uh, uh, Yadira, who's the field coordinator. She has background and she's a psychologist. Uh, Susie is my uh, star outreach health promotora. Susie is probably my most favorite uh, of our field staff. She has these luminous eyes and um, this smile that could light up a whole room. <laughs> and when I first met her, I noticed that she had a disfigured arm and she was very embarrassed about it and trying to cover it up. And I said, hey, you know what? That's a badge of honor. Pues yo nunca pensé trabajar en esto. Hace 14 años, este, yo salí este, positiva de VIH SIDA, este, porque también fui adicta, usé heroína y todo tipo de drogas, empecé a usar a los 11, 12 años de edad, a este, y nunca pensé que hoy en día trabajara yo para esto, para darle mensaje a personas que andan como yo algún día anduve, a darles información de lo que es el VIH SIDA, lo sabía en mi cuerpo. Al huevo que me da tristeza ver todo esto porque aquí viví y soy parte de esto también. Hoy en día estoy de este lado. Pero han pasado años, ya 14 años limpia y sigo viendo que está peor todo esto aquí abajo. Al menos de venir a darles el mensaje, cómo laven sus jeringas, compartir mi experiencia cuando viví aquí hacer algo, aunque sea esa mínima parte de mí hacia, hacia mi Tijuana, hacia la gente que viene de otras partes.
Día, mijo. Permiso. Buenos días. Look, Susie, you have a PhD in life. I said, you are my eyes and my ears for this study. And without you, we wouldn't be having people come back. Buenos días, muchachos. We rely on the big hearts of people that work with us to teach us about what works and what doesn't work and give us access to this community. And they are part of that community oftentimes. Hola. They're ex-drug users, they're sex workers, they're clients. All of the types of people that we study participate in the development of the, the interventions and, and in the actual conduct of the intervention. Without them, this wouldn't work. Susie's also an example of what's possible. So much of what we saw is, and what we're documenting, is bleak and it's sad and there's a tragedy to it. And we watched many people who we followed over time become infected and we watched some people die from AIDS who need not have died from AIDS in this era when good antiretroviral drugs exist and are technically freely available in Mexico. Susie's undetectable, she's healthy, she's robust, and she's an inspiration for people who are in her situation. Welcome to the little Preven Casita. The Preven Casita means little prevention house. This is actually the place where we have all of our research projects based. Um, Tom's studies, my studies are all here. And it's a very busy, lively place where we have people cycling in and out all day long. Today we're having a mural painted and, um, you know, this is a research project studying HIV, but um, it's also a place where people like to feel is their home. And they uh, wanted to paint the walls because it wasn't pretty and I said, well, why don't we create an art day? And so uh, we had some of the participants in our project volunteer to do some art. And so it's just a fun way to express themselves and to make them feel like real. People think of the border as a wall. And yes, we've built a wall. And that's not to my liking, but that's the way it is. Despite that, this is one large continuous community. And there really is interaction across the border and the health problems that exist in Mexico are going to be health problems that we have here in San Diego. So UCSD has to partner with Mexico since they are our neighbors in order to try to solve some of these problems. We're in an ideal situation and place to be able to do that. temprano mami ahí no le van a cobrar nada esta es una clínica era donde antes era preven casa pero aquí ya ya va a haber un consultorio especial para las personas del bordo ok, okay? A ver. studying injection drug users and sex workers and men who have sex with men and we were realizing that the accessibility to HIV care just wasn't there. 
we obviously, in a federally funded research study, can't be providing services, can't be providing HIV care in our projects. So this was a, a dilemma for me and for Tom and for other researchers that were working there. Along the same time, we had students coming to us from UCSD saying, could we set up a free clinic like the one we have in San Diego? Could we do it in Tijuana? And I said, what a great idea. And we figured out a way to make this happen, and we turned it into a course. It's a preclinical elective for medical students from UCSD and from the publicly funded medical school in Tijuana, in Uabese. Buenos días, este, muy buenos días y bienvenidos a Fronteras Saludables, Health Frontiers in Tijuana. Good morning, everyone. We have this clinic set up called Health Frontiers in Tijuana that is led by Dr. Jose Luis Burgos, who's a Mexican physician who's also got a UCSD appointment and one at Wabuse. He's licensed to provide medical care and is an HIV specialist. He directs the, the clinical activities in, in Tijuana at HFIT. And we have students studying side by side, providing free care to the poor. And most of those poor are people that are in our studies. The Ashfield Clinic is near the U.S.-Mexico border in Tijuana, Zona Norte. We're very close to the Tijuana River Canal, and we're very close to the Red Light District in Tijuana. This area has very vulnerable population, such as people who inject drugs, female and male sex workers, and a large number of migrants. Many of them are homeless and in great need of help. Your preferred language? Well, it's going to be English or Spanish, you know. I, I mean, it's, it doesn't matter. You don't care either way. Okay. But I, I'm not able to hear very well because I got an infection in my ears, okay. so you know, I mean. The clinic runs very strongly on Saturdays. Altogether, we have around 30 students. Uh, sometimes people say, well, what are you going to do with so many students? They're not going to be doing anything. Are they really going to learn about uh, global health? And, you know, the clinic is not staffed. We don't have funding for, for staff. And the nuts and bolts of the clinic are made out from the students. The students register patients. The students navigate patients throughout the different services we offer. The main services is primary care. So generally, when you're looking at a, at a needle, you want to pull the ear lobe so you can straighten the ear canal. So when you go in, you're not damaging. And then you will see through here. Many of these patients have severe barriers to uh, healthcare services in Mexico. Even though in Mexico, healthcare is universal, it's not easy to navigate the system. So for many of them, we are the only healthcare services they receive. I think it's a very good experience, especially for students, because we get a lot of clinical practice and we get to approach patients that we usually do not see in the big hospitals. By interacting with them and really talking to them, you learn a lot about them and it really changes the type of mindset that you have about the patient. These people come in with diseases that one person came in with a UTI, right? A urinary tract infection. And in America, like a UTI, go in, get an antibiotic, and then get treated for it right away. And people, because of the pain of it, uh, uh, generally just generally just get treated within the week. Right? They, they can't tolerate it. Um, but then in Tijuana, there's patients that had UTIs for three months, right? unimaginable amount of time. And it's like, how did you live for three months with this thing? And, you know, and and they'll be like a sex, sex worker. So it's like, oh, like, that must be so miserable. I think the idea is, is that it makes better doctors out of these young kids. And, and I think for the Mexican students, they're learning about resources they don't have and things that they can aspire to. From, you know, these kids show up from UCSD where they have every test available they want to run. Well, you don't have that in Tijuana. They can start advocating for things and for change that is desperately needed. In something we learned along uh, when we opened the clinic, we were seeing many patients who were affected by HIV infection. We were very surprised that, you know, even being a general primary care clinic, many of the patients we tested did not know they were HIV positive. So it was the first time they learned they were HIV positive. And overall, on a sample of about 600 patients, uh, the prevalence was almost, it was about 3.5%. So it was very much higher than we expected. 
And you know, some of the studies from our division, led by Dr. Stephanie Strati, show that the prevalence or the HIV epidemic in Tijuana is on the rise. In Proyecto Acueta, we've been studying a cohort of injection drug users for many years now, and many of our participants uh, have tattoos all over their bodies and um, their face. Some of them are gang-affiliated tattoos. Others are just, you know, very much uh, disfiguring. And that led my colleague, Dr. Vicky Ojeda, to come up with this idea to say, hey, you know, maybe we could have a tattoo removal program. Es que me dan trabajo, pero, pero, pero este... Se requiere la presentación y los traba y los tatuajes se ven muy visibles y, y llega la gente y me ven los tatuajes y ya y se asustan y no lo me dice no no usted no puede trabajar salga really? afuera. Really? Sí. Well, that's awful. A lot of the companies yeah, yeah. will pay for a, a, a right, physical right. exam and even people that have them on their backs on their stomachs they will not be eligible for employment wow. as a result oh, of never. that. And that goes from everything from like the mom and pop shops all the way to like the maquiladoras and big yeah. industries. Uh -huh. So. No. 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 We'll be looking at a variety of outcomes, not just physical health outcomes like HIV seroconversion, but we'll be looking at mental health status, we'll be looking at labor market outcomes, and the idea is really to understand what does this mean if you uh, implement this as part of a repatriation program for deportees, for example, um, or a community integration program for criminal justice populations. Yeah, that would be the dream. Like the other thing that we're doing is we're taking advantage of this program to say, well, we're going to screen everybody for HIV. And what that means is that anyone that's HIV positive, we can uh, send them to tele the HIV yeah. telemedicine program. Yeah. And then this is another way that we can kind of do broader screening for the community yeah. since we know that there is so much, you know, so many risk behaviors. Yeah. Dr. Burgos uh, came up with the idea of a telemedicine project because what was required for people to get their HIV medicines was a prescription from the Capacites Clinic. The Capacites clinics have been set up in various cities around the country as standalone dedicated HIV clinics. That's a great idea, but their, their location, at least in Tijuana and some of the other cities we know about, um, is far from ideal. And so what would happen was they get uh, tested at the HVIC clinic, they're found to be HIV positive, we say, we'll give you this referral to the Capacites clinic, which is way the heck over across the city and nothing would happen. This is happening over and over again. So he came up with the great idea of a telemedicine project that allows him to hook up with the Capacites Clinic right on the spot. Tu mano sobre tu pierna. Haz la funicular. Ajá. Buenos días, doctor. ¿Cómo está? Bien, bien, gracias. Quería preguntar. When, when we do the telemedicine consult, we always call Dr. Gallardo, Manuel Gallardo, or Dr. Lam from Capacites to let them know which patient we're uh, with at the moment and what we found during the consult and if there's any problem or if everything's fine. And we just check with them and see that uh, we're. Um, you know, seeing eye to eye with, uh, in regards to the patient. Exactly right. The cholesterol is the only thing that came a little bit low, but outside of that, everything was very good. And also there's a privacy aspect which is important. Um, the patient doesn't have to sit in a room with a bunch of other HIV patients, which they may want to avoid because they don't necessarily want anybody else to know they're positive. So the process in which Rebecca can communicate with Capacites and get a specialist opinion on the treatment recommendations that she's making works very well. They also do special things like they'll keep your antiretroviral medicine there. You know, if you're homeless, you're living in the canal, it's a constant that you're being robbed. Even things that have no value, like antiretroviral drugs, why would somebody steal those? Well, they might think they had value. And so to be able to go there and know that your medication's there is a great thing. 
te digo, tener fuerza, voluntad, no a las drogas y el medicamento. Yo sé que si lo, lo utilizo así, puede durar mucho tiempo. Les doy las gracias una vez más a los doctores y, y personas de Preven Casa que me han ayudado hasta aquí con mi tratamiento. For telemedicine, you know, we want to make sure that uh, this intervention and this program is making a difference. Uh, preliminary results from our studies showing that it is. HIV care should be simplified. Patients should have huge difficulties in reaching HIV care, having to take three buses, having to spend 50, 60 pesos, which is a lot for them, Hola. and having to get there and miss their appointment because they were late and miss a whole day of work and maybe missing their job or, you know, it is complicated. Now for them, you know, the easier, the simplest way we keep it, the more it's going to work. And who's going to benefit? Everybody's going to benefit. Everybody in Tijuana, everybody in, in the U.S. because of the exchange between Tijuana and San Diego. And, and we can prevent, and we can prevent a lot of pain and suffering through these kind of programs. UCSD is involved first because this is a fantastic opportunity for research, training, and service. And those are the three pillars of what this university espouses. On a research perspective, we can engage in social epidemiology and basic science and clinical research. We can offer our students um, an unprecedented opportunity to do global health in our backyard and be home by dinner. And we're giving to a community that is really at need, and it makes me feel like I can sleep at night. For about two years, Malcolm Linton and I interviewed and photographed over 100 people who were either living with HIV or who were at high risk of becoming infected. One of the ways we met people was through Stephanie Strathy and Tom Patterson and their collaborators who introduced us to people they were working with. Hola, I'm Stephanie. Hola. I moved from New York and I started working for Proyecto Cohete um, because um, that was a way of um, getting into the drug using community and making contact with a lot of the people I wanted to photograph. To begin with, I was taking blood from those people, doing blood tests. Um, and so they saw me as a nurse, and I would tell them that I was a photographer, um, but they reacted to me differently as a result of thinking of me as somebody who was helping, in a way, care for them or was involved with their health rather than just taking pictures of them. One of the problems with magazine and newspaper journalism is it's static. You're there for the day or the week or the month even, and you don't really see what happens to people and efforts to help people over time. And so that's really what I think attracted both of us was this notion that we were going to see the passage of time. For this kind of story, it seemed to me that it was very important to be close to the people so that when things happened, I could be right on top of it and I could circulate around the town every day, maybe a couple of times, looking for people to photograph. And none of the photographs were set up, so it was a matter of trying to catch people doing what they were doing. And I had to be there for that. When we first went there, we stayed on the upper part of the canal. And it took quite a while before we even went down. I think Malcolm went down first. And people sell heroin in the canal. They openly shoot heroin in the canal. And they make little homes called yungos that are sticks with blankets and trash. And it's a mixture of a garbage dump, a sewer, and most profoundly, a community. And part of what we were after was showing the human side of these people who are, you know, largely despised. And we wanted to show them living their lives in that community. The key to going down there to begin with was that I went with Susie. She lived there for, I think, eight years earlier in her life. So she knows everybody there. She's passionately dedicated to doing something for drug users and particularly people who are HIV positive, because she is. She would never stop anybody shooting up right beside her because that's not how she works. 
And what she would do would be to talk to people um, on a continuing basis about the possibility of stopping using heroin. But she's conscious of the fact that she needs to preserve a relationship with them. And to nag people about stopping their habits is, is not going to help her do that. Uh, she has a son who's living with her now, and the son is recently married and has a child, so Susie is a grandmother. She always felt very guilty about him because he developed a heroin habit for a while. Um, but now he's clean, and the family appears to be doing well together, and Susie seems to be happy. Victor was uh, a guy we met in Las Memorias, which is the AIDS hospice on the edge of Tijuana. Las Memorias is somewhere between a traditional hospice where people who have end-stage disease die, but more than that, it's a hostel. Most everyone's infected with HIV. Some have families and they live there as husband, wife with children. There's a wing for um, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender um, people. And it's also a place to go for recovery if you have a substance problem. Victor, um, when we met him, was very sick because he hadn't got access to HIV drugs. And he didn't get access to them until almost three months after we met him. When he did eventually get his drugs, he made a very effective recovery. I guess Victor felt some sort of gratitude to Las Memorias because they had, in a sense, given him his life back. And he would spend his days sweeping the floors and so on throughout the place. Uh, I think he did that for two or three or four weeks before he finally left Memorias the second time. Fernanda is a transgender sex worker I met in the street in Tijuana, on the corner where the transgenders tend to work. Fernanda was great because I'd met huge resistance trying to photograph the transgenders. And she was one of the first people who accepted me and allowed me to photograph her. She liked to smoke crystal, spent a lot of her time high. She was extremely funny. After Fernanda discovered that she was HIV positive, she told me that it wasn't the fact of being positive that concerned her, but it was other people laughing at her. The word she used was burla, which means mockery. We don't pressure anybody to reveal their status, but we did ask Fernanda how we should deal with that in the book. And she thought about it for a while. And then she, she, she just looked up and she said, it's okay, you can, you can say that I'm positive, which I thought was a phenomenally brave thing on her part, given the reaction that she'd anticipated. It was very important to us that the people who participated in our project felt like participants. They understood what we were doing, they consented to us telling their stories and using their photographs, and we didn't want anyone to feel like they had to do it. No one had to participate. They wanted to tell their stories. Oscar was one of the people who somebody at Huete introduced me to. He says that he has, I think, three personalities in all. One is Oscar, who is a sort of retiring young guy. Then he has the personality of Beto, who is a male sex worker. And then he has the personality of his female equivalent, Alejandra, Beto is jealous of Alejandra because Alejandra makes more money than he does. And he says that Alejandra is, is in a sense, his boss. She tells him what to do. He says she's a terrible girl because she is inclined to do things that are risky. When we met Nellie, we met her at the Trans Memoranza event, which was right. an event held to commemorate all the trans people who had been killed in, in uh, Mexico. And she invited us to her house, and she lived in, in uh, a colonia near Las Memorias, the edge of town, with her mother. And it was her mother's house and two children. And it was you know, very poor. 
And when we went there, we found out that she was caring for another woman who had AIDS. And it was astonishing how generous she was. You know, she had very, very little. And she was taking what little she had and sharing it with someone else. And the other woman she went to, Brenda, is from San Diego and had been deported. And she was caring for Brenda because Brenda's family had rejected her in part because she had become a lesbian and she had five children and Nellie was helping her get medical care and trying to help her survive. Brenda tragically died of AIDS. So the first picture I showed of Sergio and his family in Memorias was actually just a, a snapshot at a party. It was one of those situations where people say, hey, take our picture and you reluctantly do it um, and then move on to what you were really interested in. What happened to them was that Sergio managed to get out of Memorias, I guess, on a, on a pass or something like that, um, and got arrested um, carrying crystal and wound up in jail. Sergio Araceli and their son Eduardo were all HIV positive. Araceli, his wife, within a few months died of AIDS. So their son Eduardo uh, wound up getting put in an orphanage. Uneme, the orphanage where Eduardo lives, and Las Memorias, the AIDS hospice, both provide excellent care. But in this day and age, why do we have orphanages and hospices for people with HIV? In the United States and Europe, they've shuttered their doors. And the fact that they exist in Tijuana today ultimately shows the shortcoming of the response. calling on the world to adopt a new ambitious target. 90% of people tested, 90% of people with HIV on treatment, and 90% of people on treatment with a suppressed viral load. Implementing these new guidelines could prevent millions of new infections and AIDS-related deaths. How will we get there? By meeting the new UN AIDS 90-90-90 targets. We now have to complete the task to end the era of AIDS, period. Full stop, end the era. The UN AIDS goal of 90-90-90, it's a reasonable goal. It's an admirable goal, but in places like Tijuana and there are many places like Tijuana around the world. They're far away from that goal. And it's not to say that Tijuana has such a huge HIV epidemic that it can't get there. It has a manageable epidemic. It's concentrated in high-risk groups. But Tijuana needs to start looking at what other places are doing that are more serious about getting to that goal. And the first thing they're doing is they're ramping up testing. Uh, we're here providing free confidential HIV testing. Uh, we like to pop up in the community and provide testing because we found that just making testing more visible and available and quite honestly more convenient in the community helps with getting people tested. Identifying early infections is very important for a couple of reasons. Number one, we want to help the patient who's HIV positive get on treatment right away. We also want to help those individuals prevent spreading that virus to other individuals. Someone who's recently infected, so the first year of their HIV infection, is more likely to transmit that infection to somebody new uh, more than any other time during their HIV infection. So finding that person and letting them know that they're HIV infected is probably the best way to reduce the epidemic. Davy is a medical doctor and a researcher at UCSD, and he has done a groundbreaking study to look at the transmission network in San Diego. How does the virus so, move around the community here? Interestingly, when we ask people, standard public health measures are when someone's HIV infected, we say, who did you get this from? And about half the time, they're wrong. But 
um, HIV is a fast moving, evolving uh, pathogen. And every single person who's HIV infected has basically a unique strain. But that unique strain is somewhat related to the strain of the person that they got it from. So if you sequence both viruses, you can tell that they're actually linked. And when you put them in a map, you can tell what the transmission networks are in a local community. And what that told us is that if we intervened on someone who had lots of connections now, we could stop new connections from happening in the future. Here in San Diego, since the border is such an issue with us, we are starting to sample across the border to try to figure out how much of our network is shared across the border and how much of it is actually separate. Our initial work showed that there was quite a bit of separation. Um, but now when we look at some of these subnetworks, perhaps even like this one, we can see that they're quite connected, especially among men who have sex with men who also inject drugs. And also clients of female sex workers, we can see those connections go back and forth. We know that uh, the numbers are increasing. Uh, we know that this, this is a critical time for Tijuana to do something about the epidemic. And one of the ways to deal with this is to make HIV testing easy, accessible, and HIV treatment accessible. Testing is just the first part in a whole continuum of care. After you find out you're HIV positive, you then have to be linked to care. You then need a clinician who can prescribe you antiretroviral drugs. You then have to take your drugs every day. And ideally, you're getting your viral level suppressed to the level that it can't be detected in routine blood tests. And there are gaps all along the way, and that's called the treatment cascade. The United States has identified its failures because only about a third of the people in the U.S. who are living with HIV have fully suppressed their virus. And in Tijuana, the early analyses show it may be around 3 or 4 percent of people who are infected are even taking antiretrovirals. Preventing a case can be so cost effective. The same with treatment. If we treat one patient, we know that treatment is prevention. When we treat patients, their viral load drops their likelihood of transmitting is less. So it's a good uh, evidence-based strategy. Linking and engaging patients or people, vulnerable people to HIV care works. Treatment as prevention is just one way to slow the spread of HIV. There are lots of proven prevention interventions that don't involve treatment. And each place has to tailor make its response to its epidemic. In Tijuana, for example, there's a lot of heroin use, which means there's probably a lot of sharing of needles and syringes. So mobile programs go out in part of what's called harm reduction and provide clean, free needles and syringes to people. Now those programs have been cut back because they ran out of funding, but they still exist. Methadone is an opiate substitute that people drink, so they're not using needles and syringes. And in a novel targeted intervention, UCSD has begun working with the Tijuana Police Department. What we found with Proyecto El Cuete uh, and uh, our other studies of sex workers was that policing practices are actually one of the most important risk factors for HIV infection in the city. Generally, the police will see the drug users as criminals. So they will criminalize them, uh, victimize them, and uh, sometimes they will just put them in their police cars and take them to temporary jail for 36 hours even though that the law states that the possession of a minimum amount of drugs in Mexico is decriminalized and that syringe possession is also legal. So that led us to this whole other level of intervention. So instead of focusing on drug users and saying, you're a bad person, you shouldn't share syringes, you're going to get HIV, you're going to pass that on to the whole community and scare all the rest of us and get us all sick, that hasn't been effective as an intervention. So how can we look at this in a different way? Once you start to realize it's police that are scaring people into shooting galleries, taking away their syringes and breaking it. So if it's the police that are the problem, then we need to educate the police. The point or the trick to this was to find a hook that would be something that would be attractive to them that would also actually help protect the, uh, the, the IDU, the injection drug user. And what that was, was protect your own health. You know, you need to protect yourself from needle sticks. In the eyes of the police, they're more afraid of a disease than a bullet. And that's the quote that our director of the police academy uh, gave us. Today we are training the Tijuana Police Department on occupational safety issues. The idea is to minimize the risk of 
HIV infection among officers in the city. For this, we are training their trainers so they can multiply this material. This material includes three modules. The first module is HIV and blood-related infections. The second is uh, what are like the legal aspects of drug possession in Mexico. And the third is about addiction and substance abuse and how to see it as a public health problem. Allí hay gente, mil gentes, mil quinientas gentes viviendo ahí. Y, este, y desgraciadamente, eh, no todos, pero sí muchos, eh, son adictos a una sustancia, a diferentes tipos de droga. Parte de la seguridad pública es también conocer a esta gente, tener esa empatía, o sea, ponernos en su lugar, tratarlos con dignidad y sobre todo el oficial, nosotros como policías, Entender que estábamos hablando de una enfermedad, no de un crimen. Y sin embargo, ignoramos estos tres módulos, pues vamos a estar haciendo malas cosas y no vamos a ser efectivos y vamos a perder tiempo. ¿Por qué? Porque si sabemos qué debemos de hacer, cómo tratarlo, cómo canalizarlo para que se rehabilite esta persona, quitamos un problema más de la ciudad. Gracias por su Gracias. 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 Scaling up these interventions in the low and middle income countries like Mexico, I think the work that we do isn't just focused on Mexico, it's really a laboratory for the world in, in these types of settings to understand what we can do. I think it's possible to end AIDS in Tijuana, but I think we need to take a broader look. I think that Mexico as a whole should see that Tijuana is actually a window for what could be the HIV epidemic for the rest of the country. And if one was to take that view, it shouldn't just be Mexico's responsibility to stop that epidemic, given that we have this shared population across the border. So what I think is needed is a binational response. Sure, it's possible, but it takes an incredibly um, dedicated effort that learns from everywhere around the world that's having success. So we know that if you take antiretroviral drugs and you stay on them and drive your virus down to undetectable levels on standard tests, your likelihood of infecting another person plummets. Not to zero, but really, really low. We also know that if you give people clean needles, that they're likely to use them and they're likely not to spread by sharing needles. That has to be aggressively done. And on top of that, we know that condoms work. Um, we also have shown that if you give people antiretroviral drugs who aren't infected, that that lowers their risk of becoming infected, pre-exposure prophylaxis. How do you put all these pieces together? And then how do you keep people on treatment? Well, first of all, you've got to have really aggressive testing. You've got to do what Davy Smith is doing. Here. You've got to find the acutely infected people, try to break those networks up, get them on treatment. You've got to then help people stay on treatment. You can target those groups and flood them with these services. You can have outreach workers like Susie go to them, make sure they're taking their medication, make sure they're getting tested. We all know what the recipe and the directions are for doing this. And it's not happening aggressively enough in the United States, and it's certainly not happening aggressively enough in Tijuana. I think it's a bit, in a sense, academic whether we, whether we, you know, end AIDS or not. Um, uh, the point is to reduce it dramatically, which is what we know we can do. Ending AIDS also doesn't mean that HIV goes away and back into uh, its little host in nature. It means that you stop every infected person from transmitting. And if you get the transmission rate from one person below one, in other words, if one person doesn't infect another person, you're breaking the back of the epidemic. And as epidemiologists say, you're bending the curve.
can we bend the curve? Can we get down to a point where one person isn't infecting another? Absolutely, the tools exist.